Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. All right, we got my dude Taylor Johnson out here on the Soul Seeker podcast. We never really dropped in properly, I don't feel like, but we definitely crossed paths a few times in Silicon Valley days. So before we get into it, let's just drop in with some breath. So Taylor, for you, for me, and you guys listening, we're all breathe together. Now, if you're driving, you can breathe with us, which I would invite you to do. Just keep the eyes open. For the rest of us, let's just find a comfortable seat and start to close down the eyes. And just sitting up straight, feeling the feet on the floor. And just gently rolling the eyes up as if we were looking at the third eye, that space in between the eyebrows. And through the nose, inhaling as you let the belly expand and bring that breath all the way up. And through the mouth, side out. Inhaling up through the nose, letting the belly expand. When you get to the top, just sipping in a bit more air, holding the breath here. And audible sigh, exhale, let it go, let it go, let it go. And last one, slowly inhaling all the way up. Sipping in a bit more air at the top. Hold the breath, rolling up the eyes. And audible sigh, letting it go. And just opening the eyes. And here we are. Sweet. Well, I'm stoked to reconnect with you, Taylor, for the audience to break the fourth wall here. And yeah, man, I've been seeing your posts on LinkedIn and you're crushing on LinkedIn, just providing so much value. And, you know, I feel like I know you more from watching 49er games than I actually know you because I can't tell you <laughs> how many times as a Niner fan be watching the game and be like, I know that dude on the sidelines. So for everyone listening, Taylor and I were connected back in when we both lived in Silicon Valley. You're out there in Austin now, right? Yep, I am. Austin, Texas. Yeah. Now I'm in Santa Cruz. And thanks to our mutual friend, Danielle Dahl, a member of the Silicon Valley Young Professionals. Shout out, D. That. Yeah, that's how we know each other. But for everyone that's just getting to know you that might not be familiar with your story, what you're about, if you're just meeting someone for the first time, say, on an elevator, and you just have a couple of minutes to present yourself on what you're about, how would you, uh, how would you present yourself to this person? Uh, that's a great question. And just to kind of echo back, man, it's great to get the opportunity to drop back in and, and just to have a conversation. Um, you know, if I was on an elevator and I met somebody, I would quite honestly, I would say I'd probably ask more questions than I would be talking about myself. Um, so I think I'm just, I'm fascinated by humans. I think people are so interesting and everyone has a very unique story. So Admittedly, I'd probably just ask a lot of questions about them and like what they're up to, what lights them up and what are they most fired up about? And if it was to put back on me, like, hey, what am I fired up about? You know, I'd say at this stage and phase of my career in life, what I'm really excited about is, is human performance and potential. Like, what does that look like? What does it feel like for 
any individual because it's different, right? Like how you define performance is really uh, context dependent and individual specific. Um, I'd also say I'm just a very curious individual, right? So like I, my whole like sign off is like, stay curious because so much of my life and the amazing experiences and people that I've met have really been driven through curiosity um, and um, amazing mentors and just, yeah, I've just been so fortunate. So that's, that's kind of how I would answer that. That's such a great sign off to stay curious. I mean, that's been a big thing for me over the past five years with the spiritual journey, just being curious and be like, Oh, where's that going to take me? Like mm -hmm. oh, normally I would do this, but what does it feel like right now? I do this other thing. And that's what it means to build our intuition and getting back to your story. Cause selfishly, I just want to get to know you better and hear your story, but like, yeah. how, how did you get into performance? Yeah, I think, um, early age, you know, like, uh, I'd say in high school was when it really started to come online of wanting to be bigger, faster, stronger for football, mm -hmm. you know, playing American football. We had a great football coach. He was a great coach, but just not a great strength coach. And so we were just doing a lot of, you know, rudimentary stuff in the weight room. I didn't feel like I was getting any better per se. So I took it upon myself to read the books. Actually, one of the first books I ever read was the encyclopedia of bodybuilding by Arnold Schwarzenegger thinking as if that was going to make me a better football player. Like it made me look better, but probably not more athletic. But that was kind of my first foray into like, you know, understanding physical performance and just that kind of stuck. Uh, and then that big transition from like physical performance into mental performance really happened when I lived overseas. So I lived in Thailand when I was 20. I left the country, sold everything I had, moved overseas to, to train and fight professionally in Muay Thai kickboxing. Oh, wow. And I was there for... You know, a couple of months and my trainer signed me up for my first fight and said, you know, you fight in eight weeks. And it was kind of like this, oh shit moment of being like, wow, okay, this is very real. This is not like a vacation. <clears throat> not that I treated it like a vacation, but it became very real to me that I was going to go in eight weeks time. I was going to step into a ring and fight somebody who was training to kick my ass. And it just, it was a very interesting shift. I was like, okay. And physically I felt very fit. Uh, technically I knew it could probably get a little bit better, you know, in eight weeks time, like there are things you can clean up, but I was like, you know, reality, I'm probably going to fight a guy with a lot of fights, which I did. He had 150 fights. It was my first fight. Um, yeah. but the biggest difference between me and this individual was going to be my mindset. And so I got really deep into sports psychology and really trying to understand and reverse engineer. How do I put myself in a position to be successful? So that's where the kind of like those two worlds for me started to come together. Um, and ultimately, you know, when I ended up coming back from Thailand to the States, um, and originally that wasn't really the plan, but decided to come back and finish university because I was so inspired by sports psychology. Um, that's when I started to really appreciate just all the holistic nature of performance, right? It's not just about the physical body. It's not about the, the mental body. It's like the spiritual and emotional and all these different components that come together that really allow an individual to step into their potential and then see what's really possible. That's incredible, all of that. And how how did you make the jump, the leap from 18 years old to find kickboxing, Muay Thai in Thailand just within two years? Like, were you at college or what were you doing? And what was yeah. the inspiration for that? Yeah, so I was, um, I was in community college. You know, leading up to that point, you know, I um, school was very challenging for me. I, I, I say that because I didn't apply myself. And there's a whole back story there of just, you know, I just wasn't really my thing. But when I got to community college, I became really more interested in, in just learning. Like all of the curiosity really came online of like, wow, this is like building blocks of like a part of me that I can take with me for the rest of my life. Um, but it was basically in community college. And at the same time, I was running with a pretty rough crowd. Like we were getting into a lot of trouble and just really up to no good. And so like right around 19 years old, um, before my 20th birthday, I, uh, made the choice of like, I need to change something. I literally woke up one day and realized like, this is not going to go well for me if I stay down this path. Um, and so I was like, the only thing that was positive in my life at that time was kickboxing was training and I loved it. And it's like, what really kind of kept me on this track. I was like, well, I'm going to do that thing. You talk about curiosity and intuition. I was like, well, if I'm going to do anything, I'm going to do that thing because that's what feels right for me in this moment. Hmm. And so basically 
you know, wrapped up my semester at community college or however sem- it was a couple semesters, moved back in with my mom, sold all my shit, which was a whole different experience of like, you know, being, you know, 20 years old, moving back in with your mom to then take off and leave. Um, but that was, that was the choice. And it was, I, I still feel very confidently that that was one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. It fundamentally altered the course of my life. Yeah, it seems so. Like, I mean, I don't even know what's after that, but, <laughs> you know, making something that big for sure. So then you got into sports psychology and I was looking at, on your website, I noticed like a lot of different trainings that you've gone through. And one is your master practitioner of NLP. I'm stoked. Mm-hmm. I'm actually doing my first uh, NLP training coming up in a week at the time of this recording. Awesome. And for those Very of you cool. guys listening, like, Let's just start there maybe with NLP and we'll see where it goes. For someone that's just hearing about neuro-linguistic programming for the first time, could you give them a little bit of a rundown on that? Yeah, totally. I think one of the easiest ways to explain it is it's it's a way to model performance. And so uh, neuro, so it's understanding like the brain and the science of how your brain works. Um, Linguistics, like language and how it creates our world and our reality then programming is like, what are your fundamental beliefs, programs, behaviors that are put together that create like the actual things that you're building in life? And so NLP is just an amazing tool to help deconstruct and understand the world in our own internal representation. And so it gives language and a framework or a scaffolding to understand, well, how are we thinking? How are we operating? And also the awareness to say, well, if we want to change something, we can we could, if we think of our brains as a supercomputer, we can go in and change a little bit of code here, refactor some stuff here, insert an update here, and you can start to learn how to become and turn into a better version of yourself. And again, it all comes back to the self-awareness piece, but NLP gives you a set of tools and a framework to be able to work with. Um, so I, I found NLP much later in my career, mm-hmm. um, and I found it when I needed to find it. It's funny how that always happens, right? Uh, but it was one of those instances where a buddy of mine was taking a course here in Austin and he goes, Hey, I think you should do this. Like, I think you'd really enjoy this. And I like, I was like, I'm not into that. Like, it seems kind of weird. Pushed it off for a year, had the credit. It came back around the next year, took it. And I was like, instantly fell in love with it. Uh, I think a big part of that is because of my mentor in that space, Dr. Matt James. I mean, he's, he's one of the best in that space. Um, he's been around for gosh, so long. I mean, he took, he became a master practitioner at like 11 or 13. Uh, his dad, Tad James. Yeah. His dad, wow. Tad James, uh, started Empowerment Inc. like 40 something years ago. He was sitting at the table with Tony Robbins and Richard Bandler, like all the OGs of NLP when NLP was kind of becoming like a, the science, the art and science. Um, so Dr. Matt's just like a wealth of knowledge. So being able to school underneath him and learn his methods and methodologies and really like his coaching frameworks has been an absolute game changer. So not looking at NLP specifically, but just in all of your trainings, your tools in it that you use, you did mention like with NLP, like how our brain is like a supercomputer. And if there's a piece of code that we don't like, we can change yep. the code, which is yep. just such a great analogy, especially since you're in Austin. Previously, we were in Silicon Valley, such tech yeah. <laughs> influenced places, yeah. right? But the question is, how do you actually change that piece of code? Yeah, great question. So I think like first you got to take a step back and think big picture, right? So when we're thinking about, you know, how we create our internal representation, right? If if we kind of look at and say, well, unconsciously at any given moment, we're taking in anywhere between like, I don't know, it was like 2 million to 10 million bits of information per second. That's crazy. That's unconscious. Consciously, we can only grab about, like they say, in order between like 50 to 150 bits, like if we're using the supercomputer analogy. So if you're taking in like, let's say like on average, 5 million bits of information, but you're only grabbing about 100, like how do you even do that? Well, you do that by generalizing, deleting, and distorting. It's the only way you could possibly do that. But this is why like self-aware, like meditation, breath work becomes really interesting because essentially you're refocusing your attention, those 100 bits on a certain aspect, whether it's your breath or your seating, your posture, position, your thoughts, whatever it may be. So I think that's the first step, which is understanding like the sense of awareness of in order to focus or refocus, you have to generalize, delete, distort. Okay, that's like the big picture. 
when you start to unpack and realize like, well, part of that internal representation, the way we view the world, it also impacts um, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, behaviors, right? It's all part of like this internal processing that happens based on how we're perceiving information. So if you start to bring awareness to, okay, well, you know, if I'm in a conversation, I get triggered. It's like, well, why am I getting triggered by this? You know, so it's starting to kind of understand, well, is it something about this person or really it's something about me? So I think the first step in all of this is self-awareness. And how do you change it? Well, what can be measured can be managed. That's one aspect of it. So if you can start to notice and say, okay, well, if I want to show up differently in a certain situation contextually, well, what behavior would I want to exude? Right. So it's saying, okay, well, if I want to act differently, well, how might I go about acting differently? And then that next situation comes around. It's like, well, do I act differently? Yes or no. So really it comes down to like learning this, this definition of learning, which I love is like, are you able to change your behavior? You're presented with the same information, but you change your behavior. Mm -hmm. And then intelligence is, well, the rate of learning. So how quickly you can change your behavior when you're presented with information. So that's the first part. I mean, in NLP, there's a, a lot of different tools that you can use. Um, I'd say the tool that I use the most is an actual framework, uh, which is mental emotional release, which is a breakthrough session. That's what I call an inner game breakthrough session. Mm -hmm. And essentially what you're doing is you're, it's based on the premise that, you know, we have these thoughts, belief, behaviors, or uh, these emotions that influence or change our perspective of how we choose to navigate the world. So one, it's, it's bringing awareness to that. And then once we identify, okay, well, there might be these presenting problems that show up in our day-to-day, -day, right? So it could be procrastination or it could be like, you know, you're not, you're not acting out or you're not responding the way you want to respond. So it's very reactionary or, um, you know, you're not managing your time the way you want to manage. It's like all these surface level problems is what I'm trying to get at. Mm -hmm. Underneath those surface level problems is a root issue like that root problem. Like, what is that greater problem? It's almost like imagine this Jenga, you know, this isn't how you play, but if you were to play it this way, where you purposely try to pull out the bottom piece to have everything collapse, that's like finding that root problem. Mm -hmm. And when you find that root problem, you collapse all these other presenting problems and essentially you can reframe or release whatever negative emotion or limited belief is associated with that specific piece. And when you do that, you essentially give yourself this space and freedom to say, oh, shoot, this is, this is how I've been thinking, how I want to think, how I want to show up. What are my values? Because values drive beliefs and beliefs drive behaviors. So what values really represent who I am in this stage and phase and how do I want my behaviors to match? So I just said a lot there, but does that, does that track? Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. You know, all of, uh, everything we're talking about is shadow work. And, you know, something that I've been saying for the past couple of years now is like, quote unquote, doing the work just means shadow work. And the time that we're no longer doing shadow work is when we're no longer willing mm -hmm. to look at it and open it up. And it's kind of like compartmentalization. You know, you put it up on, in a box, you put it on a shelf, never to be opened again. But how how does this all exactly right? How does this all play in a role of like, performance and I, I i forget your you know you speak to the the thing about um i think you and i spoke about it before we hit record it was a couple a month or two ago whenever it was about peak performance or flow there's a mm. term i said that you're like uh i don't really you know if you could address that piece as well yeah so i um you know I, so there's a couple of things one is i don't believe in balance you don't believe balance. in what Balance. Oh, I think balance. balance is, right. I think balance is bullshit. So I think if you look at the, the actual definition of balance, it's holding things in equal parts. When do you ever, ever hold things in equal parts, especially when you're a human being with a complex adaptable system, right? You are constantly adapting and updating. Yeah. So in my opinion, you never hold things in balance. So I choose harmony over balance. Before right. we go there, because I'm I'm curious, because I've never actually asked this question before, and because my message is all around soul life balance, and when I when I hear that, I'm like, well, I was just on a paddle board, and I was balancing on the board, and I got a balance board right there. So it's interesting, like to get so caught up in the vernacular. Why do you mm. think it is so many people are jumping on the bandwagon of like, hey, I don't like balance, but I do like harmony? Because I think it's more than just the definition, because there's something else there mm. between 
balance and harmony, you know? Sure. I mean, first off, I didn't know there was a bandwagon. That's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> I think like, yeah. I think, um, you know, and I think you're right. Getting caught up in the semantics of it, it's really the definition. So I look at the actual definition of balance. And then I say, okay, if I map that across to life and areas of life, the way that the reason why I say I don't believe in balance in the context of managing life areas of life is because man, I have never experienced, and the clients I work with have never experienced true balance where everything is a spinning plate, all equal level. Mm -hmm. So it's like, hey, there are stages and phases where my career, like right now, my career is one of the most important things and my relationship with my fiance and my health, but they're not equal. They're not an equal balance. So when I say harmony, it's saying, hey, what's the thing that is most important to me in this stage and phase? Let me make sure I understand the values that are driving that. And then the subsequent behaviors that that are that are that are actually achieving that goal and that process, and what are the other variables, and how do I orient that around that, knowing that it'll shift, and it'll start to morph based on okay, so once we once we get married and start having kids, that's going to take more precedent. So it's it's this constant reshifting and harmonizing based on where we're at. So that's why I choose to say harmony over balance. You know, like yeah, I balance on my paddleboard. Hell, we balance when we're walking, we balance when we're swimming. Sure, there's that type of balance, but I'm I'm saying chunk up a level and apply that across areas of life. I haven't really found anyone who perfectly balances all aspects of all areas of their life. And if they do, that's awesome. I want to learn how they do it because I want to model that performance. Yeah, it, it's just fascinating because I don't think most of us actually know the definition of balance like for me the like when i uh, when soul life balance came through for me as a message right you know part of it obviously is like hey if i were to say like soul life integration or soul life harmony or soul life whatever it's gonna be like huh what whereas if you just replace it the work with soul and you're keeping the balance like it's easier to reframe it's like okay so obviously i have my own triggers coming up right breaking the fourth wall being like why, yeah. why is this keeping up right and the thing for me, like, I love the idea of harmony because it feels very positive. It feels very like much in yeah. flow, but I'm just coming from a place of like not understanding because most of mm. us that I know, I mean, I'll speak for myself, right? I didn't know that until I had to get educated on that through a conversation similar to this of what balance means, the definition, never actually looked it up for myself. But to your point, when you're on the PAL board or anything else, it's like, okay, I'm balancing. I'm not thinking that it's equal, right? But enough about that rabbit hole because we're we just I'd be wasting time if I really kept going yeah. at the thread. Please go on. But I did want to ask that. <laughs> I think it's great. No, I mean, I love I love the I love the discourse and conversation, man, because you know, I'm I'm always open to new ideas too. And um, yeah, so the other thing I think what we were talking about as well is um you know, I, I don't really, I don't like chasing peak performance, right? So I prefer optimal over peak. And the reason, so here's, this actually ties into a whole balance. Like and the reason why I choose harmony over balance too, is because like work life balance. First off, the question is why not life first then work? Like everyone says work life, not like life work. Like I think the order matters to some extent, but then like the balance piece again. So why optimal over peak? Um, I think there's a lot of individuals that chase peak performance, but the reality is I don't think they really understand what that means because when you peak, what happens? You, you come back down, right? Like the Olympics just ended and there was a four year cycle to get them to peak. And then after the peak, there's a very steep decline. Right. And so um, that's great if you're able to do that and you have all the support structures and systems in place uh, that allow you to do that. However, you know, the reality is most people aren't, you know, uh, very high level elite athletes with all of the support and the funding to do that. And, you know, I know Olympic funding is a little bit different, but still, um, when I say optimal, it's understanding what are your upper and lower thresholds? So what does it look like to kind of get to this place where like you're, you're like right about redlining, but you understand what it looks like, what it feels like, what activities you're doing, and you're able to kind of bring yourself down, regulate back into this normal zone. Then also like, what's the minimum threshold? You know, where you're still getting, I call it like the bare ass minimums, like where you're still getting things done, but you're not completely just like mailing it in. And so you have this bandwidth and then optimal is being able to navigate between that. 
So it's like, what are the things that you can do on a day-to-day -day basis, week to week, month to month, quarter to quarter, year to year that allow you to have consistent uh, output that gets you closer to where you want to be. And so I think the people like the distinction I have is a high achiever versus a high performer. A high achiever, mm. in my opinion, is like, it's a flash in the pan. So like they can grind, 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 achieve success, and then they crash and burn. Whereas a high performer can get themselves to a high level of performance and stay there. And they're able to find that bandwidth, to be able to sustain performance over a long period of time. So something that I'm curious about, because obviously we started off with NLP, like neuro-linguistic programming and the words that we're choosing and how that affects us on a subconscious or same thing, unconscious level, right? And I'm finding this conversation very fascinating because in the past few minutes, we've now looked at balance versus harmony, a peak versus optimal. And then the last one you just said was high performance versus high achievers. And it's so interesting because for me, like all three of those examples, I'm like, yeah, but why does that matter? Like I, I, that doesn't affect me. Like if I think of myself as a high performer, a high performer or a high achiever, I'm like, what's the difference? Like, yeah, I don't, first of all, I don't really identify with labels too much. I mean, you know, I went through the whole becoming nobody thing and renunciation kind of what you're talking about or thinking I was and no longer identifying as like this ego identity. So that's a whole nother topic, but keeping it here as like, just looking, I think this idea of a high performer versus a high achiever is very intriguing because I never consider like, okay, first of all, I'm not identifying with those labels, but say I did identify with one of those it would probably be a high achiever because my story is exactly what you're talking about, like achieving success, the successes I was chasing only to feel more empty. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of that. Yeah. I mean, so there's a lot in there. I think, um, yeah, I mean, words do matter. And again, it's all relative to the individual. So I, I choose the words that, the words that I choose basically help bridge the gap with the individuals that I'm working with. So the type of people that I work with do, do choose the label of like a high performer or a okay. high achiever. Got and it. I mean, these are like, I work with business athletes, mm -hmm. right? So individuals who either have had a sport background or want to model performance like an elite athlete would. So choosing a label to ident to have an identity to step into is actually important. Because it's like, even if, if you have no identity and you're, and you're just absolutely nothing, well, what are the values that drive your behaviors? I'd be very curious to know in, you, in your experience when you've like detached from all labels, well, what's left and what are the values that you have that drive and influence behaviors? Well, for me, it's the yogic philosophy of sadhana. And that has been a game changer for me. Are you familiar with that? No, please share. Yeah. So basically it's like being in pursuit of, as opposed to the focus of an end destination and it's yep. building the spirit, your daily spiritual practices. So a lot of times when I'm teaching sadhana, I'm not necessarily teaching it the way it actually is because I'm teaching it more like daily habits and behaviors mm -hmm. as opposed to just spiritual practices. But for me, that has been such a game changer. And then when I started on that, then I wasn't really like focused on goals. So I went like the complete other way, right? So now I'm like trying to find, for me, I call it balance, the balance in between of like, okay, I have my goals, but I'm also not uh, putting my identity into that yeah. goal because yeah. I would identify with labels as like, keynote speaker, podcaster, author, entrepreneur, but I would never identify with like high performer, high achiever, because to me, that means nothing. You know, it's like, what? it's just so vague. Like, what does that actually mean? You know? How is that different than like keynote speaker, podcaster in terms of vagueness? Well, keynote speaker, it's like, okay, so there's a conference, you're the keynote speaker, that's what it is. Podcast, okay, you host the podcast, author, writing books, but high performer, it's like, what are you performing in and what is high about? Are we going, like looking yeah, at cool. vernacular, yeah. like high, tall, yeah. what, you know? Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, this is funny, man, because like, I love this conversation. It is, right? My, my mentor, man, my mentor, he tells me all the time, he goes, you know, performance of what? Mm. 
because the definition of performance is the execution of a task or a function. Because like, if you're going to say performance, like you got to put like a descriptor on the front of it. Like, what are you performing? Mm-hmm. You know, this was a big, he was, he's still a big influence in my life now, but back when I was coaching the NFL, it's like, you know, we were performance coaches. He goes, well, are you actually in charge of their on-field performance? Like, no, well, we're in charge of their, like the physical preparation. He goes, well, that's what you are. That's what you do. And so it's cool to hear your definition or you you talking through the, um, the yield practice. Cause what I'm hearing is like, it's a, it's a focus on the process, not the outcome. Yeah. It's process based, which I totally get. I'm hundred percent behind that. Right? I think process over outcome all day. You can't control the outcome, but you definitely can control whatever is in your control when it comes to the process. And that's really your effort, your attitude, your preparation and the execution. Um, and in terms of the identity, it's like my mentor too would say, he's like, well, you know, your identity, like who you are, really, it's like, um, if you just, if you were to go to, if you were get arrested and they were to take a picture of you as they're like booking you and they say like six, one brown hair, brown eyes, you know, 208 pounds, like that's the identity, but your thoughts, your beliefs, like that's not, there's no label to that. Right. Cause those change over time. And it, his point in that is saying like when people get their identities wrapped up in the things that they do, it could be very slippery slope. So that's what I'm, I'm also hearing you say as well. It's like, you know, we can get caught up in like the label. I got caught up in that shit too, man. Like being an NFL coach and then not being an NFL coach. I was like, what do I do? It was a very interesting experience for me. Um, but bringing it back to the high performer, the high achiever, you know, a big part of that is actually defining what that means for that individual. So it's not, when I work with my clients, it's not like saying, Hey, we're going to give you this, this identifier. And it's like, what do you, what does that actually mean to you? But more specifically, we get underneath them and say, what are the values that are driving a specific area of life? That's what I'm most interested in. Because again, coming back last piece again. Yeah. I'm most interested in the values that are driving a specific area of their life. Okay. So like their values, go ahead. ahead. Yes. Values drive beliefs and beliefs drive behaviors. So wow. if we're, yeah, values drive beliefs and beliefs drive behaviors. That's so important. let's say we're, we're yeah. it's very important because if we're looking at an area of life, let's say career, and I have a client tell me, well, I value career, like, you know, financial success. I value, um, you know, adventure or I value relationships or teamwork, whatever it may be, right. They're going to give a list. I say, okay, great. Or let's say, you know, know family is is somewhere in there it's like well okay it's interesting let's actually look and say okay of your top values how much of those things are showing up in your life because i've met a lot of individuals who are very career focused but they also say family is a top value for them but they're not spending time with their family it's not that they don't value their family it's just that there's an overpower uh, or there's a this shift or an emphasis towards one thing over the other depending on the phase and phase and stage so if we get underneath their values and say, okay, well, what's really driving your behaviors? What's really most important to you right now in this moment? And how do we unpack that? Because if they give me a list of values, say, okay, great. Now let's look at the behaviors. Do your behaviors match? Because if they don't, either those values are bullshit or there's right. something blocking their action. And that becomes part of the coaching conversation. What would be an example? of something that would be valid to be a blocker as opposed to an excuse, like something that's a reason. Yeah. I mean, I think for a lot of individuals, it's some sort of negative emotion or living belief, right? That comes Ah. up where they're like, I mean, I was just on a client call today and uh, this individual fundamentally has this limiting belief that she does not trust herself. Mm -hmm. And how does that show up? Well, all the presenting problems for her is she'll second guess her decisions. She mismanages her time. She's not, she's not showing up the way she wants to show up because there's always like this second guessing and not just fully leaning into the execution of whatever she think is the right choice and not just dealing with the repercussions on the other end of that. And so understanding like, okay, that, that, that core narrative, like how can we reframe that to free up some space to then take action, and start to develop new behaviors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And what's coming up for me is I've been getting to speaking about limiting beliefs a lot in the past couple of years. And I've gotten several times uh, people reaching out like, oh, I don't have any limiting beliefs. And 
I have a certain opinion about that, but I'd love to hear from you. Like if someone's telling you that they don't have limiting beliefs, what is that usually indication of in your belief system? Um, I mean, I would say awesome. How, how, how is that? Explain to me how that works for you. Cause I think it's a very natural thing to, even if it's not like, you know, and then they have to actually have them define what is their definition of a limiting belief? How are they choosing to define it? Because the map is not the territory. I think this is what coming back to like, we're talking a lot about language, right? Mm -hmm. The map is not the territory. Your definition of a limiting belief may be very different than mine, mm. which also may be very different than theirs. So their model of their world is very different. And so part of NLP, which you'll learn once you go through the courses is like trying to seek to understand like what is their model of the world so I can meet them where they're at. Mm. that's why it's such a powerful tool because then you're understanding like you know visually auditory kinesthetically like how are they processing information so my first question back to the individual would be like well what's your definition of a limiting belief because it could be something i was like oh yeah i mean i can't think of an example right now but maybe it's something we're like yeah i don't have one of those either that's so cool what about this let me give you my definition they're like oh shoot i actually have that Exactly. And that's so, what I was getting at because your process definitely works. And I also think that there's very few people walking on this planet, especially in Western culture that are immersed in typical like Western culture and being a business professional that don't have limiting beliefs. Like what you said earlier, if someone can balance it all, like my, my hot stance is like, show me someone who doesn't have one single limiting belief. Come on, I'm waiting. I'll wait, yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, and if they if they don't, that's super impressive. I want to model how they do that. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of the fun part about it too. It's like, you know, the game we get to play is we get to play our own game if we choose to. And so it's it's changing the rules. It's I, I understand like what are the kind of like the rule sets that are out there, but our rules of engagement of how we want to show up and navigate the world, we can start to to model performance from other individuals or across different industries or contexts. Yeah. And, and you know, that really resonates with me, what you said, the game we get to pay, play, you know, and this is where language, I love that we're talking about this. Um, This is where language is so big with me. You know, it's not so much like the, the labels. I don't really care so much currently about that, but where I get become a little bit of a stickler is like, this is the game we get to play versus, oh man, this is the game we have to play. Right. Yep. And last year I called it a game time mentality. I had the most challenging experience of my life, the challenging, most challenging year of my life last year. And I was also working with clients holding space for them, right? You know, and I was looking at what's coming up for them and not necessarily like comparing it to what's coming up for me. It's just a lot of space to hold for someone else and work through their processes as you're working through your own. Meanwhile, I'm looking at my stuff being like, man, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Literally, that was a mantra that someone gave me. Like, I'm here for it. And thank you. Is there more? Working with those two things was such a game changer. And I adopted this like game time mentality, I called it, because to me, it was like, what is the purpose of listening to podcasts or educational resources, learning about quote unquote doing the work if you're not going to apply it? It's like, okay, this is the game. This is it right now. Game time mentality. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm with all the uh, sports analogies for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's huge. One little bit on that, as you're sharing, um, again, with the influence of my mentor, he goes, you know, meditation is only 50% of the equation. Mm -hmm. He's like, if you're only great at developing that awareness when you're on the mat, because what good does that do you if you're actually moving through space and navigating the world? He's like, how do you bring that awareness into each moment and day to day? I think that's really that's part of the work too. It's like, how do you accelerate your learning and actually test and tinker, you know, and com continue to develop and iterate on the rules of the game that you want to play? Because mm -hmm. that's exactly what it is. And I use the game day analogies quite a bit in terms of like, how do we work backwards from game day for an executive or whatever it may be. But, you know, you define that for each individual, whatever makes the most sense. So you're really big on self-awareness and reflection. Talk with us a little bit about how someone can become more self-aware and then also build into their practice like time for contemplation and reflection and why you would want to prioritize these things. Yeah, I think um, I'll, I'll frame it as like 
in the area of like career, because uh, a lot of the individuals I work with are heavily focused on career, right? So for me, self-awareness is a foundational piece of performance. So the the best, like some of the best performers are deeply self-aware. So they understand, you know, what motivates them, their values, their goals that are driving them, their values and behaviors. They understand what pisses them off. They understand how to turn themselves up or dial themselves down. So they, they have this kind of understanding of like their user manual, how, how they operate and they're constantly updating it. Right. And then the best teams, the best teams are made up of those individuals who know that about their teammates. So you get a very self-aware individual who's also aware of their teammates. And then you start to have this force multiplying effect of, you know, how do you all together kind of raise the elevation of your performance? That's kind of like the context of the business. Now, how do you do that for yourself? You know, I think it goes beyond just sitting on the mat and meditating, which I think is a fantastic tool. I think it's it's creating an intentional space to really drop in and ask yourself questions to start to audit and give yourself a framework. I think, you know, um, I was going to say men gravitate towards this more, but I work with men and women. It's probably 50-50 split of my client roster. And both men and women really appreciate the structure of like, hey, I'm going to take you through a set of questions and we're going to try to understand what is your operating system, right? So what does it look like in the context of like interpersonal relationships and how you show up in, in pressure situations, like performance under pressure? What does it look like in terms of your, you know, pre-performance or priming process, right? So if you're stepping into a big meeting, you know, how do you get yourself in the zone? Like, what does the zone mean for you, right? So it's kind of like deconstructing all these different variables and trying to give them like language to use to say, oh, when I'm at my best, this is what it works like, it looks like, feels like, this is what I'm doing. When I'm at my worst, this is what it looks like, feels like, this is what I'm doing. And then we start to come up with a continuum of in between and start to understand, well, how do we push ourselves towards our best? And, you know, when we're at our worst, like, what, is, how do we avoid that? Or how do we, how do we manage that as best we can? Because inevitably it's going to happen. So to answer your question, a big part of it is, is having a framework to work through it. Um, at least I've found that to be the most successful is give yourself a set of, a series of questions or tools or exercises to go through to start to build out this awareness and then pick one thing to focus on for the next two weeks and just bring a little bit more awareness to that thing. Mm. I think far too often people try to do too much too soon, too often. And so it's like going to the gym for the very first time, or if you haven't worked out in a long time and you go back to the gym and like most of the mentality is like, I'm going to go absolutely crush it. Well, you crush it and then you can't walk for like a week and a half and it kind of defeats the purpose. So it's like, what is a minimum effective dosage of one variable that we can take a look at and bring more awareness to and be more intentional about? And let's check and let's see like how, if anything, what, what changes? you know, in terms of like how it impacts the overall system. So that kind of comes into the reflection piece. I mean, I'm a huge fan of uh, creating um, strategic check-ins, right? And this was really important when we were working with our athletes, but it was really important when I was working for a gaming development company, we were running Scrum and Agile. So we were shipping software every two weeks and the only way we were able to do that on that aggressive of cadence is we would have these scrum check-ins where it's like every day, a 15 minute standup. And we would have a Monday briefing and a Friday after action review or a retrospective. And that was our way to kind of reconcile and take the learnings and then fold that into our next week. And that's basically how we ran our sprints. And so I model mm -hmm. something very similar for my clients where we come up with these sprint cadences where it's very intentional around, Hey, what does it look like to actually set up and plan your week? Like what are the variables you want to manage and be aware of, bring more intention to? It's really it's about intentionality. And then at the end of the week, like how do you capture your lessons learned? Because if we're really trying to improve our intelligence or rate of learning, well, you got to pay attention to what you're learning. Mm -hmm. And then of those things, what's the one thing that if you were to make a change on or add more intention to or attention, that would make everything in your life just a little bit better? Well, let's go do that one thing and let's test it and start to come up with a way to, to have that be more integrated into your day-to-day. -day. Yeah, I love all this. And something that's coming up for me is like, 
it feels like a lot of your clients may have very strong discipline because of sports. Would you say that's true? Because most of them come from so. sports background. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. I, I feel like there's a lot of people that, you know, they may not know too much about like peak performance or optimal performance or high achieving or high performing, but they are an executive and they just do. They're in their archetypal energy of the masculine and they crush and they're just crushing but then they hit that burnout or they're on the verge of burnout because they're not taking care of themselves and they don't understand like oh i even though i really know i feel better when i eat healthy and i i prioritize my workouts they almost have like this subconscious or un unconscious shame and guilt and be like, no, I, I can't take the time away from work because I have to work. Like, what would you say these people need to hear? What is the message to meet them where they're at? Hmm. You know, I think first it's, yeah, really appreciating. Like everybody comes from different backgrounds, different beliefs, different values. I think first it's asking the question of them. It's like, what's actually really important to you during this staging phase? You know, because I think part of the under trying to gain more understanding and meeting them where they're at is like, well, what are the variables in their life that are creating more of that drive and momentum either towards or away from what they want. So towards what they want or away from what they don't want, which is again, is really important distinction to understand the energy of like, what are you moving towards or what are you running away from? because both have a different energy. One is more, more sustainable, the other is not. Um, so I think first, just trying to understand like where are they at in terms of their, let's, we'll say you say people, executives that are working, like where are they at in their career? You know, are they like new in their career and they're trying to really make a name for themselves and really trying to build this foundation or are they on the tail end or are they trying to, you know, move up in a rank or the emerging leader? So I think first contextually, just trying to understand where they're at in their journey. I would also say like, you know, you don't have to be an athlete to have a performance mindset or play that mental game. I think what you, what you need is just the awareness of what is it you actually want to accomplish in your life. Mm -hmm. And so I would ask the question, it's like, if you were to create a compelling future, if we were to future pace and say, okay, six months from now, we were having this conversation and looking back on these six months, what would have to happen both personally and professionally for you to feel really proud about your progress. And that can kind of give you, I mean, I love that question. That's a Dan Sullivan question, by the way. Um, but that would basically break apart. Okay, well, what do they say first? Do they say personal first? Do they say professional first? Right, exactly. There's no, ju there's no judgment, right? There's no, ju there's no right, wrong, good or bad, but I'm listening for what's top of mind. You know, more times than not, the people I work with, professional comes up first. And I'm like, okay, cool, noted. And you to kind of deconstruct like what would have to happen. Okay. And then personally, what would have to happen for to feel proud about their progress? Okay. And then say, great. Well, what, what are the obstacles that might prevent you from getting that? What are the opportunities you want to create or capture? And what are, what are your unique abilities that we could amplify to help you get that? And so essentially what you're doing is you're having a performance conversation with them, but you're using different, different language to kind of break apart if we were to build a roadmap for them, you're just basically deconstructing the different components of what would need to be true. Mm -hmm. And they may not have, um, well, I'd say this, man, everyone is disciplined in some area of their life. Otherwise, nothing would get done. Yeah, it, you know, it's prioritization, right? You know, and you brought up um, the root or getting to the root earlier. And it's like, we think it's all professional. And then as you start to unpack the layers, it starts to become like, oh, man, it's not professional. It's all my personal stuff. It starts there. And I know for me, like, speaking from experience, when I got into to triathlons with no prior experience in swimming, biking, or running. I mean, I had ran for a few years before that, some 5Ks, maybe a couple, a few 10Ks, but not like a runner or cyclist or swimmer, not identifying as those labels, right? Or even really being able to swim from one end of the pool to the other. Not forget about coming back. So when I started training for triathlons and started doing triathlons, that's exactly when my business went through the roof, right? 
And I remember after the Warriors won the championship and growing up in Gilroy and a Warriors fan, this was what, 2014 or something like that. I don't remember. And the next day I went to the pool, the most I swam nonstop at the time, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60 laps. I did a hundred laps that day because I was like, if the Warriors could win a championship, I can swim a hundred laps. And the reason why I bring this up and like talk about fitness, is, is because it all comes back to our mindset. And one of the best books I've ever read that has to do with mindset is a book I'm sure you know well, Mind Gym. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's, you know, I think I think you're, no, I think I know, I am agreeing with everything you're saying and it really does start with, uh, with ourselves. And I think, that, you know, for me, I could do a better job personally with diet. I do pretty good job with exercise and fitness, but then the diet part, but it's all work in progress, you know, and finding that optimal harmony, right? Well, let's uh, slide into uh, your winning formula. Could you chat with us a little bit about your winning formula? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first off, man, I've been enjoying this conversation so far. This is super fun. Um, yeah, the winning formula for me, it, it's one of my, uh, it's one of the very first coaching conversations I'll do with a client. And I have it framed that way because it gives so much context to deconstructing where a person's been, like what are all the raw materials that they've gained and accumulated up until this point. So the winning formula is based on um, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. And so for those who are not familiar you know, Joseph Campbell was fascinated with mythology, specifically around these stories around these heroes and, you know, the callings that they would have on the journey they have gone. And so basically it kind of loosely goes like this, where there's a, there's a hero in a story, male, male or female, they have a calling, they cross the threshold. And as they go on this journey, they meet mentors, helpers, guides, they have, you know, trials and tribulations, they battle demons and dragons, maybe they get the girl, maybe they don't. Uh, but there's a lot of lessons and insights learned and they come back to the normal state transformed, changed. And what I love about that is if you take a step back, what you realize is we go through these different stages and phases in our lives. We're always in a state of becoming. Okay. So we're going on these little journeys and evolutions over the course of our lives. And when I really got that, I was like, what a powerful vehicle to take somebody through a coaching session where we're looking at different stages and phases in an area of life. It's important to pick just one, not just the whole thing. Although it's all interconnected as we've talked about, but you pick an area of life and you get to sit down and slow down. Again, these individuals that are running and gunning, very rarely do we make the time to slow down to actually understand, okay, what am I working with here? Right. So this is a slowing down to speed up. So the slowing down is a very methodical conversation where We're looking at values, beliefs, behaviors in different stages and phases. The questions stay the same. The thing that's different is who that person was in each stage and phase. So by the end of that conversation, we do an audit and say, okay, how do you do transformation? What does it look like? What does it feel like? When were you at your best? When were you at your worst? And so we start to give them the information, the awareness of like, shit, you know, when I was at this job, I felt most alive when I was doing this thing. And I haven't gotten anything similar to that in like two years. So again, there's no, there's no action that needs to be taken. You can choose to take whatever action you want, but it's giving them all the information. And at the end of that session, you know, I do a full PDF breakdown of each stage and phase, all the insights that are learned. We do a whole visual anchor for it as well. Uh, That gives people this opportunity to really speed back up because then we future pace kind of like what I talked through that six month future pace, we build a roadmap at the end of that and say, okay, with all this information, what are some mini experiments or a test that you want to run to start moving yourself in the direction of what you want your achievable outcome to be? Mm-hmm. And that is a whole, that's a whole session of itself with a couple of follow-up sessions for integration and calibration. And usually what happens after that session is like, that was awesome. What tends to happen is a consistent theme of like a, you know, I always ask the question, <clears throat> you know, what was a, what was a challenge or an opponent that you faced? And very often they say it's themselves. Mm-hmm. So we talk about the negative emotion and belief, right? They, they identify as a theme of like, I was shooting myself in the foot. Like I wasn't playing all out or I was doing just enough. 
right? So they are able to see that because they're being talked through this kind of like evolutionary progression. And then if they want to do something about it, then we take them into a breakthrough session and we totally reframe, refactor that aspect of themselves. Uh, so it's a very powerful, very powerful package. Yeah, it sounds amazing. So the the one question that's coming up for me is like uh, kind of my the thing I've been working through, and it's um, it's when you actually achieve that goal, right? Like recently, I had my first TED talk, and not the irony of this is not la- lost on me by any means. But the whole premise of it was on a subconscious level, I was saying to myself when. Well, when I achieve ABC, I will feel X, Y, Z. That was like the through line of the TED talk. Yet in the preparation of it, I realized, oh shit, here I am doing it again because now I'm thinking because I'm building self-awareness and practicing self-reflection. So I've Mm -hmm. brought this to conscious awareness now that this TED talk is going to be the thing that takes me to the next level, which now is another high achievement that I am chasing and putting major expectations on. So with all of that in mind, like what is your approach to goal setting so that we do celebrate our wins and we are proud of it, but we aren't lost like a hamster on a wheel chasing dopamine off to the next thing, you know? Totally. Man, I appreciate that so much on so many different levels. Um, you know, I think the first thing is uh, celebrate at 90%. Hmm. like that. Um, that came from Dr. Matt James, right? He'd say, always celebrate at 90%. He goes, you know, you know, you're going to get that goal. He goes, but you want to start to celebrate and at 90% set your next goal because that gives you the positive energy and momentum. But when you close that goal out, you then transition into, it doesn't mean like you just steamroll into the next one, but you're already in that creation space. And that's a really good positive energy to be in. So that's the first one is celebrate at 90%. The second is like, I think a total shift of how I view goals now is, you know, first asking the question, well, what problem am I solving it for? Like, what's the goal outcome that I want? But what's the problem that I'm solving for in order to get that? And so it's really approaching it from a sense of like, what are some mini experiments that I could run? Like, if I do this, then this may happen. But it's different than saying, if I do this, then I will feel that. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's a little bit of a nuance there because it's important to, have you heard of the gap in the game by Dan Sullivan? I've heard of it, but I don't know much about it. Okay. Let let me frame that up real quick and then I'll tie it back to goal setting. So the gap in the game. So for those who don't know Dan Sullivan, he's probably one of the most well-respected executive coaches out there. I model a lot of my coaching questions and frameworks from him because he's just so powerful and very effective. And he wrote a book called the gap in the game. And essentially it goes like this. There's this distinction of for high performers, right? There are where we are now and where we want to be. Okay. Now there's no issue with having a goal of saying, I want to achieve this thing. The issue becomes when we identify and compare ourselves from where we are now to that thing. And what happens is when you do that, the narrative can sound like this. Uh, When I have that relationship, I'll be whole and complete. When I have that job, I'll be financially secure. When I weigh this much, then I'll feel fit and sexy, right? What happens is you start to live in the space between where you are now and where you want to be. Whereas that's the gap, right? Whereas the gain is saying, I am where I am now. I know where I want to go. It's important to have that goal to drive, drive towards. But the only person I'm going to compare myself to is who I was yesterday, a week ago, a year ago. 10 years ago, right? That's the game because you can find those. And sometimes you need to hunt for it, but you can find those wins of that 1% improvement of like, I am becoming the person I said I would. And so you're stacking evidence and building confidence. And so I feel the same way about goal setting where it's like, Hey, look, the goal is the hypothesis is if I do more podcasts, then more people will know about my work and I'll get more clients. Okay. I don't know if that's true or not, but the goal, the problem I'm trying to solve for is maybe creating more leads, right? And so if that's true, well, the only way to find out is to test it. Mm-hmm. And so, okay, I'll, I'll go on a couple podcasts, I'll do these things. Um, and then it's all about building out the process and understanding, like, is this working? Yes or no. Does that make sense? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. No, that's, that's great. I'm, I'm a big fan of that. And it reminds me of uh, Matthew McConaughey's Oscar speech. Do you remember that? Uh, yeah. Where he's like the three people he compares himself to was like his younger yeah. self. Uh, yeah, his, his old, hero. His hero. Uh, so right. for anyone listening, I'll, I'll have to put in the show notes. I'll make a note McConaughey Oscar speech. It's one of the best speeches I've seen of all time. And I, I remember seeing that like in real time and I've referred to it so many times, but he talks about like how he's never going to chase it or never going to get to his hero because his heroes his future self 10 years ahead um yes. so that's what it brings up but hey i know we're running short on time are you good for another maybe five ten minutes yeah i can do that all right uh now it's uh, i feel like we covered a lot of ground we got a lot of good stuff in here but now i want to talk about some really fun stuff just as a 49ers fan now i will say after personally i did ayahuasca in 2019 i probably watched like five niner games since 2019 so that goes to tell you like where i'm at with watching sports these days but yeah. still long time 49er fan so that that doesn't die easily and i do remember the glory days with harbaugh and all for for me at least you know that was my glory days and that was fun who's got better than us you were uh, uh with the team then with harbaugh right was that I was what after that? harbaugh so i was with tom okay. sula and chip kelly okay so you were the tough times we were the tough. i'll tell you what man like yeah. i've spoken about this before you know i think for as challenging as that was it was an amazing opportunity period and I say that because like, there's so much lessons you can learn in the times when you're not doing well than when you're learning, when you're doing really well. And so talk about understanding human psychology and motivating people to do things that they need to do when they don't want to, mm -hmm. when you're not having a winning season and you still need to go out and practice your ass off, even though you're not going to have a winning season or you're just in a complete slump and you're not winning games. Uh, as a coach, it was a very interesting experience to understand, like, what is it really like to build a relationship and build deep rapport to have guys still be in the mix and want to do the things. So I'm at first challenge to do the was, I'm actually very grateful for those two very uh, terrible seasons because I learned a lot and built some amazing relationships, both with the staff and the players. Uh, and to your point around, like, you know, not watching football. I mean, dude, when I left the NFL, I could maybe count the number of games I mean, that was a long time ago, but like maybe on one hand, two hands at most, mm -hmm. like people were always like, you must have loved football. And the answer is no, I didn't, <laughs> you know, I did it for 10 years of my life. It was a huge part of my life and I didn't love football. What I loved is the people playing the game. Mm -hmm. So to me, it was always about like, I was more interested in a love with the people playing the game than the game itself. And so having that separation from it was, was actually quite nice. For sure. Absolutely. And your official title when you were uh, a coach on the 49ers, was it performance coach? It was assistant strength conditioning or assistant performance coach. I can't remember the exact title. What, what were, would you say was the biggest component? Would you say it was mindset? You know, I mean, it was a lot of different things. I think more than anything, at least what we did as a staff, which I think we did very well, is kind of zoom out and think of like global load management. What are all the factors that are gonna be present that could impact this individual? And how do we get them in the best position to show up on game day when it matters most and be at their best, right? So it comes the down game, mindset. So mindset's a big part of that, right? Yeah. So like a lot of it's, in a lot of the mindset conversations, man, where really it's like, you know, you're in between, you know, working out or you're in between going from lunch to a meeting and you're just having a small conversation with a guy and you're just like checking in, like, where you at? You know, how are you thinking? How are you thinking about things? How are you feeling? How are things at home? Right. It's really these small kind of conversations, but then you'd really feel it switch on when you're in the locker room and everyone's got their own kind of priming routine. And man, I, I this is the thing I do miss it. I do miss it. Like game days, more specifically right before kickoff, when you're in the locker room, and you could just, you know, the clock's counting down from when we got to go on the field. And you could just feel the energy shift as we get closer and closer. And you got like, you know, all your little pods of guys kind of going through their thing. You got the dude, you got all the dudes that are just like dancing, kind of doing their stuff. You got like the guys who are very like in their own headspace. You got the guys that are kind of like in between. I love that. 
because essentially you're just understanding like how they get themselves into that zone so that when that when that kickoff happens it's it's just game on I'd love to hear a piece from you this. So my human design is manifester. So like things come through visionary, right? So it's just an invitation. You could be like, no, nah, that's a projection. It doesn't resonate with me, but I'd love to uh, hear a piece from you about like the different archetypes of like preparation, you know, and you could draw from your experience in the NFL because it's so true. Like some people need to find their Zen and their comms. Other people need to get like a little riled yep. up and yeah. Yep. And just a, kind of like learning more about it. And for me, getting into keynote speaking as well, I'm super fascinated by that because when I started speaking on stage, I would need to ground, I would need to meditate, I would need to do some breath work. And I mean, I do a lot of that. So I'm pretty good there. But like now I'm at a space more where it's like, I want to get a little excited before I go and I don't want to be calm. Like, I, I'm like, let's go, you know, it's exciting. So it's interesting too how there's kind of an evolution. Totally. I mean, I was Speaking of one of my colleagues who does a, a lot of keynote speaking, he basically flies around the country and around the world and gives talks. And, you know, he, he's like, he, can, he kind of gets to a point where it's just another day. And mm -hmm. so for him, which he's talking to, it's like, he's just so calm, cool, collected about. It. Plus, you know, he's talking about mental performance, you know, so he's very just dialed in individual. Uh, but, you know, for him, it looks a little bit different now than what it did when he first started. And so your question was, you know, what are the different archetypes I mean, I think it's a pretty classic spectrum of you got the people. If you look, if you think of like the inverted you on like the Yerkes Dotson, which is a you know, inverted you in terms of like low arousal, low performance, high arousal, low performance because you're overstimulated, but there's a sweet mm. spot in between. Everybody's, everybody's different of what that sweet spot looks like for them, but it's understanding where do you fall on that curve and what feels best for you to do the thing. In this case, performing as a keynote speaker. And every individual is so different. So it could look like, you know, on the spectrum of like just being very Zen in their own head. I mean, that was me. Like when I was fighting, like I was very just in my own space, wasn't a big rah-rah guy. I was kind of like, I was doing my mental reps. That That's what got me fired up, which is this calm, cool. My avatar that I would put on is Jason Bourne. Yeah. Right. So that was the mindset, cool, calm, collected, right? Anything come my way, I got it. I'll handle it. Right. And that's like a, when we talk about mindsets or identity, that's actually a big tool in the toolbox of mental performance is adopting the mindset in the behaviors of an individual, an avatar, a hat you can put on. Um, but that's another conversation. So there's the Zen piece. And then there's like up the spectrum to like, you know, the super, you know, dancing, hooting, hollering. I mean, hell, I even have one player who freaked, he loved to get smacked across the face. So I'm like, are you sure, man? He's like, yeah, hit me. I'm like, all right. Ah. But like oh, you're not gonna hit me back though right <laughs> yeah yeah because yeah, um, right. you would destroy me but um but yeah man there's everything in between so i think the bigger question is like what data points do you have to say okay when am i at my best like what was i doing what was i feeling like what was what happened before during and after that's crucial before during and after because then you can pull that out and say okay i did these things before I was on stage, this is how I managed myself and off stage. This is how I kind of reintegrated back into normal. And then you can just map that across to something else. Yeah. I think it would just be a, a fun piece of content, uh, like a lead magnet or something, you know, I think it could get people in anyways, though, Taylor, this has been awesome. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time and you sharing your wisdom and how you're showing up in the world and it's just everything else. So thank you, man. Congrats on the engagement. You didn't get married yep. yet, right? Not married yet. Nope. Next year, but Amazing. engagement. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And for everyone listening, just check the show notes. I have Taylor's website, his LinkedIn and all the ways to get in touch with him right there in the show notes. Taylor, thank you so much for coming on the pod. Thanks, bro. Appreciate you, man.